Senator Rob Portman, somebody that knows a little bit about this budget stuff. I mean, you as a former budget director, I think you can know what's going on. But let me ask you, what, what if, how have Republicans messed this up, at least in terms of the, of the message? I mean, you know, you look at the polls, the, 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 the public is saying that it's favoring the president in this. Uh, you know, his, his, his numbers are up on this. Uh, his numbers against potential Republican rivals are now up today in the latest polls. W where have the Republicans had their missteps? I don't know if there have been missteps in terms of the substance, maybe in terms of some of the message and communication, but if you look at those same polls, they will tell you that most Americans get it, which is that we have to reduce the spending. You can't continue to spend more than you take in. And we also shouldn't be raising taxes on a weakened economy. Yes, we should reform taxes, and that means getting rid of a lot of these loopholes the President talks about, exclusions and deductions and credits. Uh, but I think we can do a better job of communicating that. Uh, but I do think on substance, you know, the American people understand the problem here, which is we've got to get the spending down and we've got to grow this economy, and that includes tax reform. So we need to do a better job perhaps in communicating it, but uh, I, I think actually what the Republicans are communicating today with this cut, cap, and balance uh, discussion in the Senate, which happened earlier this week in the House, is where a lot of Americans want to end up, which is you've got to have a discipline to balance the budget. But are you going to sign on to the Gang of Six? They've got a trillion dollars in increased revenues. Well, I think, as I've uh, said publicly a lot since then, and I, and I went to the briefing the other day with about 50 or 60 senators, it's a step in the right direction. I think they've got some, actually some very good contributions to the debate, including tax reform and including the fact that they do deal with the entitlement issue, which has to be dealt with because those important programs are unsustainable over time. I just heard my colleague Jim Clyburn talk about that. Uh, and finally, uh, I think it's very important that it's bipartisan. You know, it's the one effort out there where you get Republicans and Democrats coming together. And I think it could actually mesh well with what I think is the ultimate solution here with regard to the debt limit increase, which would be a debt limit increase consistent with the formula that Speaker Boehner came up with mm -hmm. that is the same as the amount of cuts, and that would be, let's say, a trillion dollars or a trillion and a half. Uh, we just heard some about the Biden discussions. That's about where they ended up. And that would take us into early next year and during that time period to make continued progress, one, on tax reform, to be sure we can get this economy moving because that's one of the key ways to do it, and two, is taking on these longer-term problems. So I think that, to me, uh, is a much better solution than continuing to hold out for some kind of a grand bargain that won't have the votes and that increases taxes on a fragile economy or doing nothing, uh, which would be a huge mistake in my view. Senator, a couple weeks back when, uh, when Senator Coburn left the Gang of Six, he became the Gang of Five for a little while. I was told that you were actually invited to join that group and, and make up the sixth member, uh, but that you, were, you declined that invitation. You were hesitant to do that. Have you been, along the way, hesitant about the Gang of Six? Do you have concerns about the direction that it was headed up until this moment? Well, I, I just expressed a moment ago the fact that I'm encouraged by what they're doing. And I, I wasn't formally invited. I did sit down with a number of the members to talk about their proposals and to try to give them my best counsel on kind of how you deal with the revenue side and how you be sure you have spending cuts that can actually stick. Um, and again, I'm encouraged that you've got uh, a number of senators on both sides of the aisle. Not all of us have signed up to the details because the devil is always in the details, but we've signed up to the concept that we do need a bipartisan approach here and it's got to deal with tax reform and it's got to deal with the long-term problem, which is sustainability of these entitlement programs. So. I, I think it's a healthy contribution. I think it can make a contribution even now because if we follow this formula of having reductions in spending immediately that can be agreed to, and this is pursuant again to the Biden talks and, and other talks where there have been, I'm told, a trillion or a trillion and a half dollars worth of spending reductions agreed to, and then during the next six months, while that debt limit has been increased during that time period, to do basically what the Gang of Six is talking about, which is to give directions to the various committees of Congress, including the tax writing committees, to do their work and to bring to the floor of the House and the Senate under an expedited procedure legislation to actually get the long-term problem under control and deal with the tax reform that's desperately needed to get this economy moving. I, I guess the problem with that is the President has said repeatedly that he would veto a, uh, a short-term extension, which is what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, he said he's, point blank over and over again. Uh, he has said that point blank uh, a number <laughs> of times. He's also yesterday said that he could support some kind of a short-term extension. Which then Jay Carney know. said it was three days or so. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Well, you know, look, uh, this is a negotiation. The president uh, obviously um, is taking out a negotiating position. On the other hand, we cannot allow the country to go into this post-debt limit period. It would be a huge mistake, in my view. C it would hurt I? the economy. It would hurt beneficiaries. And, and frankly, it's something that uh, we can avoid by coming up with a sensible agreement to reduce the spending, which is the problem and deal with these other problems. We aren't going to reform the tax code in the next three days. It can't happen. It needs a little time 
to be able to allow the committees to do their work. But we should force them to do their work on an expedited basis and get it done because it's one way to grow the economy. Can, can I just ask you what your message, because you're a guy with a lot of credibility on this, you're a fiscal conservative. What's your message to those Republicans that we hear saying uh, that they've already compromised, cut, cap, and balance is a compromise, they don't want to go any further, and uh, even some suggesting that uh, going past August 2nd without raising the debt limit wouldn't be a big deal. What do you say to them? Well, first of all, we don't know what the date is. It may not be August 2nd. It may be August 10th. Uh, the Treasury doesn't know. No one does. It depends on receipts coming into the government and outlays going out. But at some point, we're going to hit this limit. And at that point, we need to have a resolution. Because the alternative, in my view, is uh, an impact on the economy, which is negative. No one can predict it, but I believe interest rates will rise. Uh, second, it has the very real risk of hurting beneficiaries in a number of different federal programs who frankly are relying on the fact that these programs are in place. So we need to deal with it, and we can, and we should. And I think, again, the sensible result at this point is to come together, figure out which of these cuts we can agree to. They need to be real. They need to be credible. Otherwise, the votes won't be there in the House of Representatives or, frankly, here in the Senate. And then make a commitment during that time period while the debt limit is extended to deal with a longer-term problem and with tax reform. Sen Senator, in our last 45 seconds or so here, Grover Norquist was quoted in the Washington Post today saying that uh, his interpretation of the pledge of to not raise taxes is such that a, not extending a tax, a tax uh, cut would not necessarily count as a tax hike. This has allowed some Democrats to say there's some wiggle room here. What's your interpretation of that? Could you imagine seeing that as part of the revenue discussion, as part of the Gang of Six and elsewhere? You know, what I keep going back to, Rick, is the issue of what is the impact of taxation on the economy? Um, you know, uh, there are lots of technical discussions about, uh, you know, whether the pledge is being adhered to or not and what the baseline is and so on. I think we've right. got to back up and say, look, this is about the economy. We do not want to have a tax burden on the economy that does not enable us to get out of this deep ditch we're in to be able to create jobs and get the economy moving. So that's, right. that's what I look at. And my concern with some of the proposals, right. including some of the proposals the President's pushing, it was lead right. to a much bigger burden mm -hmm. on the economy. Right. We, we are out of time. On, on that note, uh, Senator Rob Portman of Ohio. Rick, I think we're going right. to be doing Twitter. this for a few more days. Uh, someone tells me that it might. Twitter.com slash Rick Twitter.com slash John Carl. Do your top tweets. We want to hear from you.